An unusual story published on August 15, 1915, in the American Baptist newspaper, The Watchman Examiner, claimed Charles Darwin recanted his theory of evolution and accepted Christ prior to his death. The article was attributed to British evangelist Elizabeth Reed Hope, who claimed she had visited Charles Darwin at the request of his wife Emma shortly before his death. Despite disclaimers from the Darwin family, the story surfaced again in various church publications in 1922, 1955, and 1957. The story has been periodically revived to the joy of true believers in spite of its obvious untruth. We present this story in an interview format as a literary device to bring Lady Hope's words to life. The author has created questions that might have prompted the actual words written in her newspaper article. A few words have been added to facilitate the flow of the interview without changing the content and intent of what she wrote. Following Lady Hope's interview, a rebuttal by Darwin's family and Darwin himself will be presented. Again, their words are actual quotations taken from their letters and from Darwin's autobiography. Welcome to Radical Religious Right Radio, a division of Foxy News. Our motto, we think for you so you don't have to. We have a sensational breaking news story to report that will shake the very foundations of evolutionary science. According to a reputable eyewitness account, Charles Darwin, on his deathbed, recanted his theory of evolution and accepted Christ as his savior. The Lord be praised! The American Baptist newspaper, The Watchman Examiner, first reported the story in 1915, 33 years after Darwin's death. The eyewitness account, as told by a consecrated Englishwoman, Lady Elizabeth Reed Hope, has since been buried by the liberal press until now. The Lord be praised! Our investigative reporters have dug the story up, and we now proudly present it to you, our faithful, trusting, and gullible listeners. Through a miracle of faith, we have contacted Elizabeth Reed Hope, who is known by the name Lady Hope, until her death in 1922. Praise the Lord. Good afternoon, Lady Hope. It is good of you to return ever so briefly to us and confirm this earth-shaking news. Is it true that you were at Charles Darwin's deathbed and witnessed his recantation of evolution and acceptance of our loving Savior, Jesus Christ? Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to the faithful and confirm the miraculous happenings that glorious autumn afternoon as I sat with the well-known, bedridden Professor Darwin. Most fascinating! Please tell us the occasion of your visit. When did it actually occur? It was September 28th, when my husband and I were living in Beckenham, Kent, about six miles from down where Professor Darwin lived. Professor Darwin's wife Emma invited me to pay her husband a visit. Emma, as you well know, was a true believer. I believe she wished me to ask her husband to accept Christ into his life. As his health was failing rapidly, and she feared for his eternal soul. Were there any other witnesses to your visit beside his wife, Lady Hope? No, there were none. The good professor's son Francis and daughter Henrietta were absent. Emma arranged my visit so they would not interfere in my mission. I understand that they closely guarded their father to spare the family the similar embarrassment incurred when Professor Darwin's grandfather, Erasmus, accepted Christ on his deathbed. The family, of course, vigorously denied that event, as you might expect. As you know, Erasmus had been an atheist physician, pre-evolutionist, and blasphemous poet. Praise God and his miracles of faith! Well, Emma Darwin is a good enough witness for me. I can understand her distress to think her dear husband's soul would burn in hell for eternity if he did not accept Christ. It must have been a literal hell for Emma Darwin 
to live with the author of Evolution. What more do you remember from your visit? Well, he was sitting up in bed, wearing a soft embroidered dressing gown of a rather rich purple shade. Propped up on pillows, he was gazing out on a far-stretching scene of woods and cornfields, which glowed in the light of one of those marvelous sunsets which are the beauty of Kent and Surrey. His noble forehead and fine features seemed to be lit up with pleasure as I entered his room. Ah, apparently he was expecting you, and pleased to see you. Your visit was extremely thoughtful and blessed. Please continue. Well, he waved his hand at the window and pointed out the scene beyond, while in the other hand he held an open Bible, which he was always studying. What are you reading, I asked, as I seated myself at his bedside. Hebrews, he answered. Still Hebrews. The royal book, I call it. Isn't it grand? Then, as I watched, he placed his finger on certain passages and commented on them. It was heartwarming to realize that Professor Darwin was so knowledgeable of the holy book. When he had finished, I made some allusions to the strong derogatory opinions expressed by many persons, such as Mr. Huxley, on the history of creation, its grandeur, and their shameful treatment of the earlier chapters of the book of Genesis. The Lord be praised! How did Professor Darwin react to that? Well, he seemed greatly distressed. His fingers twitched nervously, and a look of agony came over his face as he said, I was a young man filled with unformed ideas. I threw out queries and suggestions, wondering all the time over everything. And to my astonishment, my ideas took like wildfire. People made a religion out of them to my great regret. The poor man! It sounds as if he never intended his wild theories to be taken so literally, and contradict the scriptures. He was apparently surprised that so many believed him. It appears so. He continued on about the holiness of God and the grandeur of this book, looking at the Bible, which he was holding tenderly all the time. He suddenly said, I have a summer house in the garden, which holds about thirty people. It's over there pointing through the open window. I want very much for you to speak there. I know you read the Bible in the villages. Tomorrow afternoon I should like the servants on the place, some tenants, and a few of the neighbors to gather there. Will you speak to them? What shall I speak about? I asked. Christ Jesus, he answered in a clear, emphatic voice, adding in a lower tone, and his salvation. Is it not the best theme? And I want you to sing some hymns with them. You lead on your small instrument, do you not? The wonderful look of brightness and animation on his face, as he said this, I shall never forget. For he added, If you take this meeting at three o'clock, this window will be open, and you will know that I am joining in with the singing. Glory to God! There can be no doubt that Professor Darwin's soul had been saved thanks to you, dear lady. Oh, I do believe it. Glory to God. How I wished I could have made a picture of the fine old man and his beautiful surroundings on that memorable day. I would love to continue our conversation, Lady Hope, but our time is up. Thank you for setting the record straight about evolution and for your eyewitness accounting of the real character and beliefs of the famous Charles Darwin. The Lord works in mysterious ways, does he not? Oh, glory be to God. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to enlighten your listeners concerning my visit to Professor Darwin. God bless you all, and goodbye. Radical Religious Right Radio has done it again, folks. We have scooped the liberal press, exposed their bias in not reporting the truth about evolution and their beloved Darwin, whom we now know did not 
consider his theory of evolution to be based on scientific fact. It was just a wild idea of his that spread across Christendom as a wildfire, destroying faith and morality of those who believe. Now we know better. Now we know the truth thanks to the good lady, Elizabeth Reed Hope, and the good Lord for bringing her to us. Thank you for listening, and tune in again tomorrow. May the Lord be with you, always. Lady Hope's story was either an outright lie or a fantasy that became a reality in her mind after 33 years stewing over the great evil Darwin brought into the world. The story of Lady Hope's meeting with Charles Darwin on his deathbed was denied by all of Darwin's family. They insist she never was present at his bedside at any time. Darwin's son, Francis, wrote in a newspaper article, Lady Hope's account of my father's views on religion is quite untrue. I have publicly accused her of falsehood, but have not seen any reply. My father's agnostic point of view is given in my book, Life and Letters of Charles Darwin. Darwin's daughter, Henrietta Litchfield, also replied to Lady Hope's claim. In a February 23, 1922 article in a London newspaper titled, Charles Darwin's Deathbed Story of Conversion Denied. In that newspaper article, Henrietta was adamant. She said, I was present during his last days. Lady Hope was not present during his last illness or during any illness. I am sure he never saw her. But in any case, she had no influence over him in any department of thought or belief. He never recanted any of his scientific views either then or earlier. We think the story of his conversion was fabricated by her in the United States after she moved there. The whole story has no foundation whatever. The fallacious story of Darwin's conversion periodically returned to the news and was spread by religious groups. The story so greatly annoyed his granddaughter, Nora Barlow, that she took strong action to repudiate it. I was so annoyed at the claims my grandfather had converted to Christianity and recanted the very thing he devoted his whole life to that I restored the controversial passages edited out by my father Francis Darwin in the original edition of the Autobiography of Charles Darwin. The second edition now includes my grandfather's perspective on God and his harsh criticism of Christianity. I hope this will silence his dishonest critics once and for all. In that autobiography, restored to its original form by his granddaughter, Nora Barlow, Darwin wrote referring to the Christian Bible. But I had gradually come to see that the Old Testament, from its manifestly false history of the world, from its attributing to God the feelings of a vengeful tyrant, was no more to be trusted than the sacred books of the Hindus or the beliefs of any barbarian. By further reflecting, the clearest evidence would be requisite to make any sane man believe in the miracles by which Christianity is supported. Thus, disbelief crept over me at a very slow rate, but was at last complete. The rate was so slow that I felt no distress, and have never since doubted, even for a single second, that my conclusion was correct. The more we know about the fixed laws of nature, the more incredible do miracles become. The men at that time were ignorant and credulous to a degree almost incomprehensible to us. I gradually came to disbelieve Christianity as a divine revelation. Darwin was forced to publish The Origin of Species before he intended by the revelation that Alfred Russell Wallace had a similar theory. Once the origin was published, Darwin was viciously criticized by the press and clergy. Huxley took it upon himself to defend Darwin's theory quite vigorously, but Darwin declined to answer the attacks accusing him of being a foul atheist and much worse. 
He did, however, reply to the personal attacks in his autobiography, which he had directed should not be published until after his death. Darwin wrote, I can indeed hardly see why anyone ought to wish that Christianity to be true, for, if so, the plain language of the text seems to show the men who do not believe, and this would include my father, my brother, and most of my friends, will be everlastingly punished, and this is a damnable doctrine. Concerning the Reverend Robert Paley's classical argument about finding a watch and comparing it to a stone as proof for the existence of God from design, Darwin wrote, The old argument of design as given by Paley, which formerly seemed to me so conclusive, fails now that the law of natural selection has been discovered. We can no longer argue, for example, that an intelligent being like the hinge of a door must make the beautiful hinge of a bivalve. There seems to be no more design in the variability of organic beings and in the action of natural selection than in the course that the wind blows. Everything in nature is the result of fixed laws. Darwin was troubled that there was so much suffering in the world. Why would a loving God cause or allow an infinite number of innocent animals, including man, to suffer needlessly? This God, if he existed, seemed to be a malevolent deity. Concerning God, Darwin wrote, A being so powerful and so full of knowledge as a God who could create the universe is to our finite minds omnipotent and omniscient and it revolts our understanding to suppose that his benevolence is not unbounded. For what advantage can there be in the sufferings of millions of the lower animals throughout almost endless time? The presence of so much suffering agrees well with the view that all organic beings have been developed through variation and natural selection. Darwin acknowledged that there were those, such as his beloved wife Emma, who had strong emotional beliefs concerning God. As to those who have blind faith and an inner confidence that God exists, Darwin wrote, Therefore, I cannot see that such inward convictions and feelings are of any weight as evidence of what really exists. There are those who claim that Darwin was actually a theist, if not a Christian that he believed in a divine, non-personal first cause. He wrote on that subject, I feel compelled to look for a first cause, having an intelligent mind in some degree analogous to man, and I deserve to be called a theist. This quote is usually taken out of context, for in Darwin's following words, he states since then he has changed his mind. He observes that, such grand conclusions cannot be trusted from a mind that came from the lowest animals. In fact, Darwin's evolution theory does not address the beginning of all things. He wrote, I cannot pretend to throw the least light on such abstruse problems. The mystery of the beginning of all things is insoluble by us, and I, for one, must be content to remain an agnostic. The clergy accused Darwin of being an atheist. In his autobiography, he answered, In my most extreme fluctuations, I have never been an atheist in the sense of denying the existence of God. An agnostic would be the more correct description of my state of mind. I have not thought deeply enough to justify any publicity. A man ought not to publish on a subject to which he has not given special and continuous thought. Darwin was bothered by the argument of first cause. He wrote in his autobiography, I am aware that if we admit a first cause, the mind still craves to know whence it came and how it arose. 
nor can I overlook the difficulty of the immense amount of suffering in the world. The whole subject is beyond the scope of man's intellect. A German student badgered Darwin concerning God in letters. Darwin answered, I consider that the theory of evolution is quite compatible with the belief in God. But you must remember that different persons have different definitions of what they mean by God. Science has nothing to do with Christ. I do not believe there ever has been any revelation. As for a future life, every man must judge for himself between conflicting, vague probabilities. Darwin lived in a loving relationship with his wife, Emma. He was well aware why she and other good people have religious beliefs. He gives two reasons why he thinks people are religious. He wrote, A religious belief comes from the constant inculcation in a belief in God in the minds of children, producing so strong an effect on their brains that it would be as difficult for them to throw off their belief in God as it would be for a monkey to throw off its instinctive fear of a snake. The other reason was the grandeur of nature. Darwin had been exposed to wonders of the rainforest, mountains, reefs, islands, shorelines, and oceans. He wrote in his autobiography, In my journal, I wrote that while standing in the midst of the grandeur of a Brazilian forest, it is not possible to give an adequate idea of the higher feelings of wonder, admiration, and devotion which fill and elevate the mind. One would think that this alone was reason enough to believe in God, but later in his life he wrote, I well remember my conviction that there is more in man than the mere breath of his body. But now the grandest scenes would not cause any such feeling and convictions to rise in my mind. This sense can hardly be advanced as an argument for the existence of God any more than the powerful, though vague, and similar feelings excited by music and art. Darwin was aware and distressed that much of his wife's faith and that of the religious world was based upon revelation. He thought that the best way to change people's minds was to educate them. Ignorance led to superstition, gullibility, and blind faith. On the subject of revelation, he wrote, For myself... I do not believe in any revelation. It appears to me, whether rightly or wrongly, that direct arguments against Christianity and theism produce hardly any effect on the public, and freedom of thought is best promoted by the gradual illumination of men's minds, which follows from the advance of science education. Concerning Bible miracles, Darwin was explicit and reflected the philosophy of Thomas Jefferson. Darwin wrote, By further reflection, the clearest evidence would be requisite to make any sane man believe in the miracles by which Christianity is supported. The Gospels cannot be proved to have been written simultaneously with the events. They differ in too many important details to be believed that they were actually written by eyewitnesses. Aside from the religious fanatics, who ruthlessly attacked Darwin after he published Origins, his friends and biographers believed him to be a gentle person who truly cared for his fellow man. Darwin wrote, I can imagine with high satisfaction giving up my whole time to philanthropy. This would have been a far better line of conduct. If he, man, acts for the good of others, he will receive the approbation of his fellow men and gain the love of those with whom he lives. And this latter gain undoubtedly is the highest pleasure on this earth. By degrees it will become intolerable to him to obey his sensuous passions rather than his higher impulses, which, when rendered habitual, may almost be called instincts. Darwin had seen the cruelty of slavery during his voyage around the world. He had argued with Robert Fitzroy, 
the captain of the Beagle, on the subject. He personally knew black Africans and met the indigenous populations of South America, Polynesia, Australia, and New Zealand. He considered them to be intelligent human beings in every sense of the word. He believed education and opportunity could transport them from their savage life to one of civilization. He deplored slavery and overcame the cultural belief that Europeans were the superior race. I abhorred the savage treatment of Brazilian slaves, the torture, the breaking of families. It was a happy day when we sailed away from that blighted land to which I wished never to return. Darwin was derided, attacked, ridiculed, and cursed since he published Origins. Nevertheless, his theory has been accepted by the scientific world. Amazingly, evolution is still denied by those of the fundamentalist faiths to this day. Darwin was a man of high morals. He had great empathy to his fellow man, high integrity in his work. He was tireless in his effort to advance science. He showed a great love of mankind, and he was a loving husband and father. What more could anyone ask? There is no truth to the claim he abandoned that philosophy on his deathbed, nor did he recant his theory of evolution. It appears that Lady Hope and others did not know who he really was and the significance of what he accomplished. They feared him and his theory then, as they do today. Radical religionists continue to blame Darwin's theory of evolution for all human suffering. They refuse to accept abundant scientific evidence substantiating evolutionary theory beyond all reasonable doubt. In his later years, Darwin's mind was always busy. He wrote and dictated until his very death. He had manuscripts near finished ready for the publisher. He had plans for other research projects he hoped to conduct. The fact remains, Darwin did not recant or convert. Those who believe Darwin recanted evolution and accepted Christ on his deathbed were delusional or liars or both. Thank you for listening to Secular Radio Theater, Darwin's Recantation and Conversion.